this panel session on, on algorithmic bias, uh, equity, and data protection. Uh, so that's really one of the big topics, how digital education can actually uh, support and you know uh, equity and make our world more inequitable, uh, more equitable, sorry. And of course, one of the, the risk of uh, algorithmic bias uh, is that it will actually amplify a lot of the human biases that we already have. So that's one of the aspects which is dealt with in our digital education outlook 2023. And you know, I have uh, the great pleasure to have Ryan Baker, who actually wrote a chapter on that with us uh, today, and who's going to present. So Ryan is actually a really uh, good friend of the digital education outlook. He was uh, the scientific advisor of the 2021 uh, edition of it, and so has again, you know, contributed to this one. And we are very delighted that 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 it is the case. Uh, so he, Ryan is a, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. We also have Nancy Lowe with us, uh, who is one of the very distinguished researchers uh, on digital technology and, and has done really incredibly interesting work on that and coming from the University of Hong Kong. And we have Paul Prinsloo as well. Uh, Paul, if you can put your camera on, you know, on, on coming uh, from the University of South Africa and who is actually uh, also an expert on learning analytics, but also, you know, uh, how to uh, algorithm bias plays out in that and data protection and how the two are going together. So the way we're going to organize the session, uh, Ryan will actually talk about, you know, this specific chapter of the Chile Education Outlook and tell us a bit about, you know, uh, what algorithmic bias is all about and how this it relates with data protection. And then we are going to have a, a discussion. And so don't hesitate to put your questions in the chat. You know, I will try to my best to relay them to the to our speakers today. Uh, and then we'll also try to look at the more positive side, uh, possibly of uh, technology and try to see how actually it can help to 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 support equity and not to be a deterrent and it can also make education more more inclusive. So Ryan, I we have the floor. Thank you. And thank you for uh, the invitation for your kind words, Stefan, and thank you everyone for being here. So as Stefan mentioned, I'll be discussing um, the uh, content of our chapter, um, the state of the situation and policy recommendations for algorithmic bias. So <clears throat> today, algorithms for education embedded in adaptive learning systems and at-risk prediction systems are positively impacting many learners in many countries. But not all algorithms are equally effective for all groups of learners, and that's what's called algorithmic bias um, in this domain. So what is algorithmic bias? Well, in a classic definition by Friedman and Niesenbaum, biased computer systems systematically and unfairly discriminate against individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. And concretely, um, you can see that in educational algorithms, in cases where the performance of those algorithms, how good they are at identifying which kids are at risk or which intervention to give a kid, in cases where the model performance is substantially better or worse across mutually exclusive groups of learners who are separated by things that they can't change about themselves, such as race or ethnicity or gender. <clears throat> how is this identified? It's a three-step process. First, we have, to we have to obtain data on student identity so that we can see if students of different identities are being impacted. Then we have to check model performance for students who belong to different groups. And then once we've done that, we have to analyze what the expected impacts are going to be on those students. So there's a big challenge in this first step because often key data is not available on student identity due to the laudable goal of protecting privacy. Privacy is a good thing. and non-biased educational technologies are a good thing, but often these two goals are in conflict the way that current policies often set up. Um, and when we talk about having data on identity um, to be able to see if there's algorithmic bias, it's worth asking, bias against whom? Many groups of learners can be impacted, and different groups are protected by law in different countries. For example, the UK Equality Act of 2010 creates protections against discrimination on the basis of sex, race, ethnicity, disability, religion, age, national origin, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And so preserving fairness for these legally defined groups is essential. And 
Educational algorithms often make educational systems more effective and they lead to better outcomes. But these better outcomes can be unevenly distributed. We need to be able to make sure it works for all of the legally protected groups and even beyond that. Because other groups may be impacted too. For example, Okumpa et al. have shown that sometimes educational technologies can be less effective for rural learners uh, who are uh, often not protected under law. And Baker et al. 2020 shows that students who have parents in the military, which often leads to high levels of mobility, um, often are also impacted. There's been relatively extensive research on algorithmic bias in education in terms of three types of variables, race and ethnicity, gender, and nationality. But there's been limited research on algorithmic bias in education uh, in terms of some of the other variables that I mentioned. And for example, whether learners are in a city, uh, a rural area, a suburban area, um, whether learners are indigenous, um, learners' socioeconomic status and poverty, whether students are in public or private schools, their native language, disabilities, parental educational background, and students are military connected. So there's been a little bit of research on some of these topics, enough to show that it can be a problem, but not the same degree of research we've seen on these three more heavily studied topics. <clears throat> also, algorithmic bias has been much more heavily studied in the uni United States than in other countries. As recently as 2021, we could basically say that in terms of algorithms used in educational technologies, there was essentially almost no work outside of other uh, outside of the United States. That's uh, changed a lot in the last couple of years, and there's now some limited research in Europe, Australia, and Latin America, but still much less and not nearly what's needed. And it's important to have that research happen because once we know that there's a problem, these problems are usually actually pretty easy to fix technically. The issues in fixing algorithmic bias are not a matter of we don't have the algorithms, we don't have the technical approaches. We can fix algorithmic bias, but we have to be able to determine it's there. And so um, we can do such thing as collect better data, uh, which Karen Bai has talked about. And Kizilchek and Lee have a really good review of algorithmic methods for addressing bias. So again, the limitation is often in, are we even looking for it? And do we have the data to look for it? Rather than, can we fix it once we've found it? And by, um, by collecting that data and going through these kind of procedures, we can go from the current state, which is all too common, of unknown bias. There's bias and we don't know what it is, to known bias, which is a case for some systems where we've determined that there's a bias, to fairness, not having some students get you know, radically worse uh, experiences from educational technology than others. Finally, to then having these technologies do what they can do very well in many cases, which is correct the biases existing in society by giving great learning opportunities to everybody and increasing social equity. So some of the core obstacles, I've mentioned privacy, and that is a big one. And again, privacy is a very important goal. The problem often is that the privacy regulations and policies that are created are too restrictive in ways that don't increase privacy protection much, but strongly reduce the ability to fix problems. For example, no access to data whatsoever on student identity, rather than having very controlled and carefully managed access to student identity data. Another one that we see in some legislation in various places is requiring uh, technology vendors to discard key data on student interactions and outcomes. Um, if, for example, at the end of the semester or after one year, which means that we can't go back and check if the problems were happening. Um, also, the, a lot of the structure of it is that right now, if an organization allows a bias audit, that can lead to them being in the media um, as having bias problems. So commercial organizations are incentivized to hide bias rather than admitting the bias in their systems and then fixing it. Um, again, we can't fix if it's not there, but if an organization is attacked heavily for the fact that there is bias in their technology and they're trying to fix it, that's actually counterproductive. There's also clearinghouses for effectiveness, uh, such as the What Works Clearinghouse and Evidence for ESSA in the United States, that treat products as effective or ineffective overall, rather than saying, this technology has been demonstrated to work, say, in wealthy cities in the northeastern United States, but we don't know how to work in other places. If clearinghouses instead broke out the evidence and didn't just say effective, ineffective, but effective for who, that would go a long way towards helping us uh, identify that there's algorithmic biases out there. 
And finally, <clears throat> there's uh, one thing that is an obstacle is the lack of education-focused toolkits for algorithmic bias. Educational data is different than other kinds of data. The, the toolkits that are out there are often general purpose. And so uh, the people who want to address algorithmic bias in education often have to build their own code from hand. So related to this, some policy recommendations. Um, I'm not sure how to, I think my screen's slightly covered by the zoom here. There we go. So some policy recommendations I'd like to offer include considering algorithmic bias when developing privacy policy and mandates so that privacy requirements protect privacy, but don't prevent researchers and practitioners from addressing algorithmic bias. <clears throat> requiring algorithmic bias analyses, including requiring the necessary data collection so that we can make sure our technologies aren't unfairly biased against some students. Creating standards for algorithmic bias analysis based on local context and local equity concerns. Um, the United States in particular often wants to, uh, people, researchers in the United States want to export our views on what categories are important to the rest of the world. It's really important we not do that and consider uh, which groups might be impacted by algorithmic bias separately in every local context. And relatedly, fund research into unknown biases around the world, uh, particularly in the countries that the folks I'm speaking to are coming from, so that you can know what the specific problems are in your local setting and what kind of technologies are impacted. Fund development of toolkits for algorithmic bias in education and redesign effectiveness clearinghouses to consider learner diversity. All of this is in our article in much greater detail. So to conclude, the potential of algorithms for education is high, and the best adaptive learning systems and at-risk prediction systems have made large positive impacts on student outcomes. So if there's one takeaway I hope you don't take away today, it's that these technologies are bad and should be gotten rid of. They're actually really good. Educational technologies, a lot of them have made a big difference in kids' lives. So we definitely want to keep that. We just want to make them better and fairer. This potential cannot be fully reached if algorithms replicate or even magnify the biases already present in society. So we need to research and resolve algorithmic bias to develop educational technologies that reach their full potential and in turn support every student in achieving their own full potential. Good policy can help fix this problem or poorly designed privacy can make it worse. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to what my uh, fellow panelists have to uh, say about these. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Before we, I turn to, you know, the. Nancy and, and, and Paul, I would like to ask two short follow-up questions. Um, one is whether you could give us one example, you know, of, of uh, obvious bias that is problematic in the case of, of education, because we, in fact, we tend to know more about what's going on in, in the, let's say, you know, the justice or the, the finance uh, world. And the second question relates to your, the, the way that, you know, you ended and you reminded the potential of, you know, uh, adaptive learning systems, for example, for, for education. And there are some cases where, in fact, we do want the systems to work better for some students than for others, you know. Uh, uh, sometimes, for, for example, if we want to use technology to, to reduce the uh, equity gap, or if you want to make it more inclusive, then obviously, you know, the, it will actually, it should be working better for, for example, students with special needs and those who don't have these needs and, or, it should be working better for low achievers and high achievers, all, the, all these kind of things. So when do we have a, a, a problem? Sure, so those are two great questions. Um, there's a lot of examples of algorithmic bias in education. Maybe one that's uh, been in the media a lot in the United States at least is at-risk prediction systems. At-risk prediction systems um, predict whether a student's at risk of dropping out of high school and why. And high school graduation is an important policy goal uh, around the world. A recent review, there have been a couple examples where it's been identified in those systems in the United States. So some platforms like Infinite Campus and Bright Bytes have gone to you know, some effort to kind of try to identify and fix these problems. Um, but a recent report of a state level initiative in Wisconsin found that the algorithms were functioning less well for students in some cities um, and in some rural areas than for other learners. Um, possibly making the rec recommendations less effective, which meant that the school leaders in those districts who are using them um, might be taking action to support the wrong kids for the wrong reasons. And 
perhaps as part of that, that review found that there wasn't much evidence that uh, that that system had made any positive impact in the state of Wisconsin, unlike other initiatives that have been more successful. On a more extreme case, um, an investigative reporter found that one large platform, PowerSchool, was deploying a system that was heavily algorithmically biased to schools. And in fact, that system was essentially telling, in one school district, was telling school leaders that if a student was black or was poor, they were gonna drop out of high school. And if they weren't black and weren't poor, they weren't gonna drop out of high school, which is really problematic and a real misuse of that kind of technology. Um, your second question, um, I've forgotten. Can you say, just remind me what it was? Yeah, that, you know, sometimes you want to have differentiated. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, <clears throat> thank you, Stefan. So, what I would say to that is that right now, what we're seeing is technologies that typically, across these studies, are less effective for the groups that were already traditionally underrepresented. Now, there are specific educational technologies that do close gaps. In the United States, for example, Mathia, has, uh, which is a math learning platform for high school and middle school, has largely has repeatedly been shown to lead to better outcomes, particularly for underserved learners and English as a second language learners. Um, so that one's correcting gaps. But in general, the direction of algorithmic bias in systems where it hasn't been addressed is systems work better for the students who are already advantaged than for the students who aren't. Thank you. So let me turn to you, Paul. Uh... You know, so one of uh, Ryan's arguments is really, you know, the importance to combine data protection, privacy and data protection, and, you know, the ability to identify, uh, you know, a, a bias. And so what are your, what's your, your, your basically, you know, in your opinion, what would be a good way to combine, you know, these two different aspects and, you know, so have both a robust privacy and data protection, regulation, low practice, and actually, uh, you know, being able to identify and, and, and address bias. Thanks, Stefan, and thanks to everyone for the opportunity to think with you about Ryan's proposals and algorithmic bias in, in the more general. Allow me firstly to express my heartfelt appreciation for the invitation and for the opportunity to reflect with Ryan, Nancy, and other participants about algorithmic bias. Secondly, I would like to congratulate Ryan and Aaron and Sion on an excellent overview, not only on algorithmic bias, but also on current evidence of algorithmic bias in education. Before this chapter, I the, the evidence was scattered all around the place. So this is super helpful. Thanks, Ryan. So in my response, I relied not only on this chapter by Ryan and co-authors, but also on Ryan's earlier publication with the title, The Current Trade-Off Between Privacy and Equity in Educational Technology. And I would really suggest that the audience and individuals find that paper is it's, it's also very, very brilliant. So I'm furthermore responding to the question regarding my recognizing my own positionality in the context of post-apartheid South Africa, where the classifications of humans into four distinct races dramatically and traumatically shaped individuals and communities' access to services, education, financing, healthcare, and economic opportunities, to mention just a few. So though apartheid has come to an end, the classification at birth of individuals into four distinct races continue to not only highlight the intergenerational effects of apartheid, but also serve as a means to redress the inequities and the injustices of the past. And I think this is in alignment with, with, with Ryan's key proposal is under what conditions can the same classification serve to correct injustices and result in more, in, in a, in more e equality. So while the categorization of individuals into these four distinct races enables expanded opportunities for those previously disadvantaged individuals and communities, the categories of black, white, Indian, and colored are increasingly fraught with contradictions 28 years after apartheid ended. And I think that is in first part my response, Stefan, is to say we, we, we need to pause for a moment to say that the algorithmic bias is possibly linked to and starts with how, how we categorize and our assumptions about our categories. So just a few short remarks. 
So we we algorithmic bias illustrates that data are never just data. Uh, and I think we will all agree that data are never neutral. But we need to understand data as essentially agentic. And the agency is becoming even more pronounced when personal data becomes part of algorithms and algorithmic agents. Therefore, whatever data we collect and whatever category, these data become actors often in ways not foreseen by the collector or the designer or the owner of the algorithm. And I think that's the dilemma that Ryan poses for us to say, under what conditions can these data and can these categories help us to understand learners better? And, and the, the constraint is how to balance that with the privacy of students. The second remark is just in my preparation and uh, for, for this panel, I engaged again with Balka and Starr in 1999, how they thought about categories and classification systems. And they state that we stand for the most part in formal ignorance of the social and moral order created by our classifications. So these algorithmic biases plays out and become part of policy and infrastructure and influence the students' work, uh, life and our life opportunities. So Bauke and Starr's work on classification systems during apartheid South Africa shows how much suffering resulted when these categories became operationalized in economic, social, educational, technological, and political relations and structures. So I think that's the first point. It, it, is, it is not, not a, a, a something to be not taken lightly. And I really appreciate the attention Ryan and his co-author spent to acknowledge the potential harm. But the, the, the other side of the harm is under what conditions can it bring good. So allow me just to, to provide some pointers. So I think privacy is not only a technological problem, but a social problem. So we can either see personal data and privacy as commodity or as human right, but there's also other understandings of privacy that I think can help us understand the dilemma of providing assistance, but also respecting privacy. The work by Luciano Floridi, uh, I find very, very interesting. And he suggests that violations of informational privacy are now more fruitfully compared to a digital kidnapping rather than trespassing. That's a very strong metaphor. An ontological understanding of informational privacy, according to Fluridi, suggests that personal information is not something that can be stolen or traded, since personal information is not separable from the person to whom the data belongs. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the contextual integrity of the moment under which the data was originally collected. So, so your chapter, Ryan, has for the first time provided an overview of existing evidence, but it also indicates how limited our current knowledge is. And I like that, that bulleted list on that one of the slides of the areas of possible bias that we don't know and don't understand yet. So is there a way to have both? In your article, you suggest this, we should support the sharing of data that we should provide demographic data to vendors to check for algorithmic bias. My question is, do they have the appetite? Uh, are they con as concerned as we are and why should they? Uh, your second proposal, Ryan, is incentivize vendors to conduct algorithmic bias audits or conduct them directly. Uh, and not only do they do I question whether they have the app appetite, but what is the incentive? Why should it be incentivized for them to develop a concern for the biases? Is it not actually a moral obligation without any monetary value? Or am I missing the point? And then your third proposal is encourage vendors to adopt data infrastructures that enable privacy protect protecting analyses. For example, allowing school district and state researchers and other external researchers to inspect or conduct algorithmic bias analyses. So from in conclusion is considering the amounts of data we already have about our students learning journeys. I wonder to what extent do we really need the demographic and sensitive data at the first point of entry into understanding student success. Or can these start to be considered in a later phase in one-on-one -on -one conversations with educators and support staff? So I just question, and there's three questions. I just wonder at what 
point should we start to use demographic data in order to understand student success? The second question is, do our students know when and how we use algorithms in steering their learning journeys? And do they have a right of appeal? And I think that is of concern is often if we, while we can identify bias, often students will not know that they are harmed in the process. So do students know when and how we use algorithms in steering their learning journeys? And the third and last point, Stefan, is of particular concern is the vulnerability of higher education in the global South, who has neither the capacity or infrastructure to collect, analyze, and use student data, but while outsourcing these data services to vendors from the global North. These are just my points. So, so thank you as a first, first entry point for the conversation. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. And thank you now. So, Ryan, uh, hold on. Actually, there is one question that for us that I would like you to address afterwards. And actually that's you know the importance of uh, demographic data because in fact, you are uh, uh, in your chapter also kind of uh, skeptical about willing to use them. And so you're very, try to limit you know the, the use of, uh, of them in some way. And we have a question that was asked directly about that you know, from, from our audience and was uh, the identity data should actually be you know, collected, made visible. So, Please, you know, uh, keep that in mind for later. There are a few more questions, but I would like to go to Nancy. And, and one of the things you did, uh, Ryan, too, is to show the sometimes the importance of other types of actually uh, categories, like you mentioned the military, uh, you know, and how that that's not a usual demographic uh, characteristic, you know, and but that has also an impact and that may matter for, for, for these different systems. So Nancy, you know, in your, you know, in Hong Kong, in, in Asia, and the, the, the country that you know. So where do we stand with that? And and what would be the meaningful categories, uh, you know, of, uh, for you, given the type of research that, that you did? Right. OK, thank you. Well, first of all, I also want to echo Paul's uh, congratulations to, to Ryan and also actually to, to, start, to Stefan uh, for, you know, the uh, working through such a important piece of work. Um, I want to sort of start by saying that um, I like very much Ryan's uh, point about, you know, um, the context. So different places could have very different issues. And I would like to sort of share my perspective of our context. I mean, in Hong Kong and possibly in China and in, uh, you know, our part of the world, um, people tend to be quite sometimes maybe over positive about technology. And so there is a strong sort of uh, movement towards, um, you know, welcoming and learning about the technology. Um, and when I think about AI and education, um, well, at least in Hong Kong. I mean, I was talking to my students earlier and I said, you know, we, I mean, there's two possibilities at least. One is AI for education and the other is education for AI. So I think, you know, what we've been talking about and what the chapter has been talking about is very much AI for education. That means using AI technology to support learning. But in our part of the world, it's much more on learning about AI. So educating for a workforce that is um, sort of capable or ready for an AI world in terms of more on in terms of an economic discourse. And so, um, you know, for several years now, um, there's a lot going on in Hong Kong schools in terms of learning about AI and getting students to sort of create systems say, who, uh, that can uh, recognize images and so on. And there is much less um, sorts of awareness of bias issues. Now, on the one hand, because we don't have that much use of um, sorts of e-learning uh, there are, but there is not 
that strong in terms of, say, for example, the kind of selection, modeling, and uh, predictions, and so on. Um, I don't think we have that much in terms of formal at the formal system level. So, so people are less um, uh, sort of aware of this. And in thinking about, you know, how I mean, I'm not saying that in Hong Kong. Uh, we don't have bias issues. And I think this is an issue that um, should be much higher in our consciousness or awareness. And I would be think I would think that, you know, how so on the one hand, we've been talking about how we can create systems that would be less prone to bias or that we can detect their uh, biases. And I think, you know, to to reach that point, yes, the technology how we design this technology, how we develop the system and how we monitor it and so on is important. But I think at the same time, it is a system within the human society. So, so I think we also need to have a human-centered way of dealing with this. And so to me, particularly in our context when students are you know, very much sort of learning about what to do and so on. I would say we should actually, I mean, a lot of times students would say any failures of the system to be a kind of like, more like a bug, a technical failure. But in fact, a lot of it could be that you don't have enough training data. So what does not enough training data mean? Or it's not um, sort of efficient enough or accurate enough so, so I think, you know, we, we should be making use of that kind of situation for the, stu for the teachers and the students to be thinking more about, okay, so what does it mean? And I think, you know, giving them the opportunity to create systems, uh, you know, it, give them an experiential way of learning about how biases come about and what should be done. And I think having that kind of conversation, um, so, I mean, early on, um, in earlier sessions, there was this talk about co-creation. And I think co-creation is, uh, in fact, a very important model of learning. I'm not thinking that everybody should be sort of creating AI systems, but in making use of them, we need to know something about what it is. And so, so, the, the bias part should also be um, through the, I think it would be more effective if we can learn about it through a co-creation process as well. So and, I haven't uh, quite uh, answered your question in the yes, way it, you have answered. Is, uh, clearly there are categories like um, culture, uh, ethnicity, or say even disability and so on. I mean, the the system may not have cater well for those, but but I think in our case, um, I think probably thinking about uh, a people-centered, um, educational oriented solution could be, um, you know, one of the things that we could think about. Thank you, thank you, Nancy. So Ryan, uh, there are a few questions for you. So I would say perhaps we can start with the one on, you know, the demographic data and the what kind of information we should try to collect when and and you know for that uh, we have the question that also Paul alluded and we have one that comes also from the audience asking basically on how to control what you know the the vendors are are doing you know so should there be a, a control before the products are put in the market uh, should there be, you know, research mandated on that? And so you've mentioned the tension that, you know, there are in the, the disclosure rules, for example. So do you, what do you what do you suggest on on, on that front? Um, and I would say the last would be and and perhaps related to to what uh, Nancy said, you know, the perhaps to remind us about the sources of of the bias. You know, is it in the data and how they, you know, uh, that we have before? Is it in the algorithm itself you know and can we learn by trying to 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 get a better knowledge of that um yeah so go ahead ryan oh goodness i don't even know where to start but i guess let me start with that last one because i remember it recency effect <laughs> um 
where is the bias? <clears throat> bias kind of emerges in the interaction between all of these things. What data do we put in? What metadata do we put in? How do we build the algorithm? Did we think about these issues when we were building the algorithm? And then how do we use it? And Shamia Karambaya in some of her work has really kind of articulated that bias really can pop up in all those things. Um, essentially, if you get any one of them wrong, you're probably gonna have a bias system, right? So you, if you collect data that's only from wealthy kids who are of traditionally represented groups, your algorithm just won't work as well in other groups. If you collect more diverse data, but there's kind of um, still a smaller proportion, a much smaller proportion, or it's very different for underrepresented groups, it won't work as well. So if you don't collect the um, the data to be able to check that, you won't catch it. But then, you know, you also have to like pay explicit attention to developing algorithms and choosing algorithms that are less likely to be biased. And there are specific things like cost sensitive classification that you can do and uh, and um, um, data amplification that can help you to address and fix the biases. But then if you put it out in the world in a user interface, and maybe this kind of comes to the the human part of it that I think Nancy was so you know well articulating, if you put an unbiased technology in the hands of someone who has biases without the appropriate training, they'll often find ways to re-bias it. Um, so there's all those problems. And to me, the key is that we have to get all those right, which requires awareness, better training on the developers of algorithms. I think the developers of algorithms, a lot of the people who, you know, people don't go to work in educational technology because they want to make the world worse for the most part. I think a lot of these organizations care, but um, they sometimes are, are blocked by policies at the local educational agency, state educational agency, regional educational agency, national, or laws that make it hard for them to gather the data they want. They don't have clear guidelines on what data to get and what to do. And then, sorry, I somehow got muted. And then um, particularly if they're in an environment where they could get in trouble for having pro for, for it being known they have problems, they have a strong incentive not to find out about them and fix them. So policy that makes it so that, um, policy that makes it so that there's actually rewards in the environment for doing the right thing, or at least not punishments for doing the right thing, will unlock what I think is the good people in a lot of these organizations who do want to address these issues, but right now find it hard to. Thank you. You want to say something on when to, you know, uh, the kind of uh, restricting oneself in terms of collecting demographic data. So when do you need to do that? Do we do it on an exceptional basis mm -hmm. or do we do it as a routine? And, and so what, what's your view on that? Well, that's a great question. I think different, different, uh, different countries, different regions, different regulatory environments are going to make different choices about this. I think the very minimum is you have to be able to calculate it at least occasionally and early for auditing purposes. That's the very minimum. Um, and I think the very minimum of what you collect should be national census or protected group data. I'd like to see collection on other things like urbanicity and um, uh, la native language, but like, uh, but I think that's the very minimum. Um, a more maximal take would be that it's routinely collected, but then locked down very carefully. I'm certainly not arguing for it being like to the four winds, you know, shared freely. But there are uh, privacy protecting database technologies and data enclave technologies these days that are pretty reliable. Um, the data is relatively low in sensitivity um, if used careful, if used appropriately. So I think a more maximal one would be usually collect it, but lock it down carefully. A more minimal one would be explicit rules uh, that require it for audits. And as for when in the process, as early as you can do it, right? Like um, ideally you don't want to have a technology. These technologies, a lot of technology in the world gets developed and then people use it. Educational technology gets developed while people are using it. In order to build a lot of these algorithms, you have to have an initial pool of data. You have to have something actually happening. So the earlier in the process we're thinking about these issues, the fewer students are going to get a less effective experience. Okay, thank you. Paul, Nancy, do you um, want to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yes. I actually want to say a couple of things about um, data and how do we detect bias. 
um, first of all, I agree with um, Ryan that, you know, in terms of education um, solutions, they need to have something to start with. And so it tends to be less perfect in terms of, say, the comprehensibility of data and so on. And I think in um, creating or using any system, um, we should actually establish or collect data which provide us with a baseline. So what is it like before we implement the system? And then we can then check, you know, whether different, because sometimes it's difficult to know, you know, whether our data is biased or the, um, or in fact, sometimes the system itself could be, I mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, human systems are perfect or fair. In fact, human systems itself is biased often. So, so if we see changes because of the implementation of the system, we can then start to think who benefits? I mean, in terms of the before and after, and then we can then check it, that's, that's one way. And I'm also thinking that we need to get people, I mean, I mean, still that sort of, you know, engaging other stakeholders into addressing the problem, which is, um, can we say, if we could actually um, get people to think about using a system, say if you have um, teachers, principals, policymakers, I mean, the issue about education data or how then we make the data to be really useful, um, Ryan had a very good point about it uh, in his talk and also in, in the chapter, that data tends to be hierarchically related. We, if we don't have that kind of relationship kept in when we when we sort of collect the data, much of the power is gone. And then also we need, if we can have time series data mapped to the individual and the unit, it becomes much more powerful. But people tend to think about, um, you know, privacy and, and so, so a lot of times, why do you need my data? Why do you need all that? And I think, you know, they need to be able to say, for example, if we can give them a system, a, a kind of simulation system or whatever, if they, they can ask questions, what questions can they ask? So what they say, if you can have, say, different data, different kinds of data, different kinds of relationship kept in the data, if they have um, that to explore, then they can begin to see. So I think it's still the kind of transparency and explainability issue, but having them to have the capacity to engage in it probably would, would make a difference. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you, I, Nancy. I, I love the idea of a simulation if students would enroll and say, but we, we use your data and these are the purposes we use your data. We, we have a moral obligation to ensure effective learning experiences. So, and then to show them the simulation, how these variables are taken into account for admissions or for support programs or for extended programs. I think that can really empower the student body, but also allow them to, to interact and say, but these are the categories missing that we think in our context play a role. For example, in huge part of, uh, of the African continent, race is not an issue because everyone is black. Uh, so, but what are the categories that may be, may be very, very important to understand student learning in Accra, in Ghana, or in, in Abuja, Nigeria? So, so, and I think there, Ryan, I really appreciate. So we must go to the context to say, what are the categories in this environment that help us to understand student learning? And how do these categories relate? And then we build the algorithm. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a and we're, we're, we're going, you know, closely toward the end of, of the session. And I would like that we finish on a positive note on, you know, the power of, of technology to not uh, amplify bias, but but reduce it and, and make, you know, the world more equitable. But before we reach that, uh, one question for Ryan, you know, we in fact, the, the way we talk about algorithm bias is very much related to, to the system itself. And as, you know, Nancy and you mentioned, and actually as many uh, comments in the chat, you know, show 
human beings are biased. And sometimes, as you've mentioned, you can actually use information feedback that you get from a system in a biased way. So is there some research about that? You know, For example, if I use my early warning system that tells me that uh, high school students are at risk of dropping out to, for example, expel them from school rather than support them to actually stay engaged. Uh, so how do we, you know, work on that? And there is a second question for all of you, you know, which was actually uh, uh, from one of the participants. Uh, can we use, you know, AI to, to compensate prior bias? But if we do that, and how can we ensure that we're not going to create some new ones? So that's the the one of the big questions that was asked in the in the chat. So Ryan, do you want to start, and then we'll we'll have a sure. Well, those are both great topics. So <clears throat> a lot of the talk about harms from at risk prediction systems, in particular, um, there's the talk about harms is often talk about ineffectiveness in terms of published papers, like um, just it didn't work or wasted effort, wasted time. Um, <clears throat> there have certainly been anecdotal reports of, um, there have certainly been anecdotal reports and media reports of uh, specific uh, places where there have been some of the bad, really awful decisions you're talking about. That hasn't largely been the, uh, the experience, I think largely because most of the vendors are responsible enough to provide some training about what to not do. And most of the school districts and local education agencies that use it are thoughtful enough to also be watching for that sort of thing and paying attention to it. Um, in fact, actually a great example seen in Todd Feather's article where Elgin, Illinois was using the system by power school that I mentioned earlier that was, was saying, if a child is black or poor, they're gonna drop out, otherwise not. And Elgin, Illinois simply just didn't use it. They actually, like the district made a choice to not use the technology once they realized it was problematic. So that was a, a case of responsible action. Um, in terms of the other thing you asked about, will these technologies create new biases? I think that everything that fixes a problem creates new ones. And this is no exception. <clears throat> these technologies are improving outcomes. They are creating new problems and often in subtle ways. And one example I would give is that from an area we haven't talked much about, I don't think we've talked at all about it, but education based on virtual reality. There are more educational technologies based on virtual reality. Some people have a condition called simulator sickness where they can't use virtual reality. If schools adopt a virtual reality technology and they um, and they don't pay attention to the fact that some learners have simulator sickness, get simulator sickness, um, then it's, it creates a new uh, bias and a new effectively uh, disability that didn't that didn't exist. Uh, people who got who had simulator sickness before the contemporary era maybe got nauseous on trains occasionally, but didn't really have major problems, and suddenly they it can be a civil rights issue. So I do think these things can come up. Thank you. So as we're getting close, you know, let's, you know, end with a kind of a, on a more positive note in terms of, you know, what, you know, digitalization and, and digital tools can do to actually support equity. And so I, you know, ask you to make a, one final comment on that, you know, or give one example. Uh, and then we'll close the session. So Nancy, we'll start with you if you if you want, and then Paul, and then Ryan, and close. Go okay. ahead. Right. Um, so in fact, I would say, um, okay. So there there can be ways where the technology can, in fact, um, help us to move further. I mean, in our part of the world, we don't have as much going on compared to in terms of reported. Uh, compared to in the U.S., but I would I would say one thing. I mean, what's the difference between um, human bias and machine bias? Human bias generally, we don't have the power to rule everything. Machine can rule all if we are not careful. And so, so I hope that um, you know, syst AI systems can be more tentative, can be more humble. And so when they do anything, um, they won't just say this is, I mean, in, at the end of the day, it's the people behind it, not the machine. I mean, I mean, in terms of dictating what the, the machines can do. So I, I remember we had a, a conversation. I mean, it's in fact, 
uh, a seminar within which uh, people were talking about how they were designing systems to in the classroom to do facial recognition, to look at how people um, say what their emotions are, whether they're engaged or not, and, and so to do something. And then, and then, so there was a designer. And then the people in the audience were saying, okay, so if I'm just sitting there, not doing anything, am I engaged or not? Different people may be quite different in terms of, you know, their expression. So, so there's more, is it causing more danger than support? What are you going to do with it? So, so I think, you know, becoming more humble and more tentative, you know, when we were um, creating such systems would be very important. Thank you, Paul. Great, uh, great point, Nancy, about honesty and humbleness and attentiveness. Totally, yay, yay, yay. Um, in, in, in the African context, and especially in the global self, in large scale education systems, we cannot not use algorithms. It's simply not impossible to render an educational service to 400,000 students and not think of how can we optimally and ethically use student data to improve their learning. So I don't have any doubt about the fact that it can make a difference and it should make a difference. Uh, the second last point is I have a concern about the role of vendors and they, they're almost untouchable. And I think there must be a way for higher education to closer work with and to confront vendors, not to show us their algorithms, but to really, really have a much stronger voice in the development development of algorithms. And the last point is most of the algorithms are developed in the US and China. So where does that leave Africa? And I think we need to take up the challenge. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Sure. So I'll just say briefly that what you said the last thing, Paul, really resonated with me. Um, I know that you've been involved in creating a network of learning analytics researchers and practitioners in Africa. That's such an important step. We, One of the best ways to make sure that algorithms address local concerns and protect the groups that need to be protected in local regions is to have them develop locally. Somebody in the United States or China or anywhere cannot <clears throat> is not going to be as thoughtful about the local concerns as somebody local. So we really need to build the community of researchers um, and practitioners to who can do this thing locally and develop these things locally. That way, and I also completely agree with the point around um, making sure that we hold vendors accountable and that they are talking to the users, to the, you know, to, to researchers, to teachers, to school leaders, to university leaders, that, that all these voices, to students, all these voices have a stake in the process of making things that are gonna affect their lives. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I'm always welcome being contacted further by email or other way. Thank you very much. So I think that uh, we had a wonderful session. Some of the takeaways for me, uh, you know, it's really that uh, while well, technology can do a lot of good things, but we have to pay attention, you know, to possible bias, but uh, that uh, we have to, Keep in mind that it's both the human and the machine that can be biased, even so one of them has much more, as Nancy reminded us, much more potential to make it uh, systematic compared to, 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 to human bias. Uh, and perhaps, you know, that we need to uh, make sure that we can actually identify, you know, bias so that we can address it. And for that, we have to carefully look at the data uh, protection laws and regulation when, when they are being designed. Uh, and perhaps the last one is uh, that some of the, the usual ways of thinking about it, you know, like, for example, deleting data after a certain amount of time or, you know, it's no longer necessarily the, you know, the, 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 the right way to move forward in the current digitalization world that, that we live in. So I invite you to, to you know, contact Ryan and, and our speakers to read actually the book, you know, I think it's a wonderful chapter and it's really a new topic that... Uh, people should be aware of and so i really encourage you to do that and uh, it's time to thank uh, you know the three great panelists so ryan baker a professor at university of pennsylvania in the united states and silo professor at the university of hong kong in hong kong china and uh, paul prinslow a professor 
at the University of South Africa in South Africa. Thank you very much. And the next session is on the digital competencies uh, of teachers, if you want to continue uh, with uh, the conference. Thank you very much. It's just that quite often then suddenly there can the echo can start when, okay. when I'm not using the headset. Can I share my screen? Yes, please, Rosanna. Thanks. We've already done a test with uh, Ger uh, Geronimo and Natalie. So if you would like to sh test sharing your screen, that would be a great time to do it. The previous session has just ended, so we're going to begin on time. Oh, uh, 